It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart... At the door of an Irish country house in a park, fine summer weather, the summer of 1960. Porch painted white, jet into the drive, but the door is at the side and the front has a window. Porch faces east and the door is in the north side of it. On the south side is a tree in which a thrush is singing. Under the window is a garden seat with an iron chair at each end of it. Private O'Flaherty VC comes wearily southward along the drive and falls exhausted into the garden seat. The thrush utters a note of alarm and flies away. The tramp of a horse is heard. General Sir Piers Madigan, an elderly baronet in khaki, beaming with enthusiasm, arrives. O'Flaherty rises and stands at attention. Oh, no, O'Flaherty, none of that now. You're off duty. Remember that though I am a general of 40 years service, that little cross of yours gives you a higher rank in the role of glory than I can pretend to. <laughs> I'm thankful to you, Sir Pierce, but I wouldn't want anyone to think that I would uh, sit down in my native baronet's place and let a common soldier like me sit down in his presence without leave. <laughs> well, you're not a common soldier, O'Flaherty, a very uncommon one, and I'm proud to have you for my guest here today. Ah, uh, sure I know, sir. You have to put up with the like of me for the sake of the recruiting. All the quality shakes hands with me, and they says they're proud to know me, just the way the king said when he pinned the cross on me. And it is true as I'm standing here, Sir Pierce, that the queen said to me, <clears throat> I hear you were born on the estate of General Madigan, she says, and the general himself tells me you were always a fine young fellow. Bedad, ma'am, says I, if the general knew all the rabbits I'd snared on him, and all the salmon I'd snatched on him, and all the cows I'd milked on him, <laughs> he'd think me the finest ornament for the county jail he had sent there for fortune. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome to them all, my lad. <laughs> come, come, come. Sit down. Enjoy your holiday. <laughs> holiday, is it? <laughs> I'd give five shillings to be back in the trenches for the sake of the rest and the quiet. I never knew what hard work was till I took to the recruiting. What with the standing on my legs all day and the shaking hands and the making speeches and what's worse, the listening to them and the calling for cheers for king and country and the saluting the flag till I'm stiff with it and listening to them play God Save the King and Tipperary and trying to make my eyes look moist like a man in a picture book. I'm that best that I hardly get a wink of sleep I give you my word, Sir Pierce, that I never heard the tune of Tipperary in my life till I came back from Flanders. And already it's drove me to that pitch of tiredness of it that a poor innocent little slip of a boy in the street the other day drew himself up and saluted it and began whistling it at me. I clouted his head for him. God forgive me. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I, I know, I know, I know. One does get fed up with it. <laughs> I've been dogged by myself on parade many a time, but but you still, you know, the gratifying side of it too. After all, it is our king, and it is our own country, isn't it? You well, sir. To you that have an estate in it, it would feel like your country. But the devil a perch of it I ever owned. And as to the king, God help him, my mother would have taken the skin off my back if I'd ever let on to have any other king than Parnell. Your mother? What are you dreaming about, oh, Flaherty? A most loyal woman, always most loyal. Whenever there is an illness in the royal family, he asks me every time we meet about the health of the patient as anxiously as if it were yourself, friendly son. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, sir, she's my mother, and I won't utter a word again. But I'm not saying a word of a lie. When I tell you that that old woman is the biggest canat from here to the cross of Monaster Boyce. Sure, she's the wildest Fenian and rebel, and always has been. 
that ever taught a poor innocent lad like myself to pray morning and night to St. Patrick to clear the English out of Ireland the same as he cleared the snakes. You'd be surprised at my telling you that now, maybe, Sir Pierce. Sur surprised? I I'm more than surprised, O'Flaherty. I'm overwhelmed. Are you joking? <laughs> if you'd been brought up by my mother, sir, you'd know better than to joke about her. What I'm telling you is the truth, and I wouldn't tell it to you if I could see my way out of getting in the fix I'll be in when my mother comes here this day to see her boy in his glory. And she, after thinking all the time it was against the English I was fighting. Do you mean to say you told her such a monstrous falsehood that you were fighting against the German army. I never told her one word that wasn't the truth and nothing but the truth. I told her I was going to fight for the French and for the Russians. And she who ever heard of the French or the Russians doing anything for the English but fighting them. That was how it was, sir. And sure, the poor woman kissed me and went about the house singing in her old cracky voice that the French was on the scene and they'd be here without delay and the orange will decay, says the Sean Van Vocht. <sighs> Well, I, I, I never could have believed this. I, never. I, what do you suppose will happen when she finds out? She mustn't find out. It's not that she'd half kill me, as big as I am and as brave as I am. It's that I'm fond of her, sir, and can't bring myself to break the heart in her. You may think it queer that a man should be fond of his mother, sir. She having bet him from the time he could feel to the time she was too slow to catch him. But I am fond of her, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Besides, didn't she win the cross for me? Uh, your mother? How? By bringing me up to be more afraid of running away than of fighting. I was timid by nature, and when the other boys hurted me, I wanted to run away and cry. But she wailed me for disgrace in the blood of the O'Flaherty's until I'd have fought the devil himself sooner than face her after funk in a fight. That was how I got to know that fighting was easier than it looked, and that the others was as much afraid of me as I was of them, and that if I only held out long enough, they'd lose heart and give rip. That's the way I came to be so courageous. I tell you, Sir Pierce, if the German army had been brought up by my mother, the Kaiser would be dining in a banqueting hall in Buckingham Palace this day, and King George polishing his jack boots for him in the scullery. <laughs> I don't like this, O'Flaherty. You, you can't go on deceiving your mother, you know. It, it, it's not right. Can't go on deceiving her, can't I? <laughs> Tis little you know what a son's love can do, sir. Did you ever know, notice, what a ready liar I am? Well, I mean, in recruiting, uh, a man gets carried away. I, mean, <laughs> I stretch it a bit occasionally myself. <laughs> After all, it's for king and country. If you won't mind my saying it, O'Flaherty, I think that story about your fighting the Kaiser and twelve giants of the Prussian Guard single-handed uh, would be the bit of a little toning down. Uh, I, 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 I don't ask you to drop it, you know, for, for it is popular, undoubtedly, but still, truth is the truth. Don't you think it would fit in almost as many recruits if you reduced the number of guardsmen to... Uh, Ah, uh, you're not used to telling lies like I am, sir. <laughs> I got great practice at home with my mother. What with the saving my skin when I was young and thoughtless and sparing her feelings when I was old enough to understand them, I've hardly told my mother the truth twice a year since I was born. And would you want me to turn around on her and tell it now, when she's looking to have some peace and quiet in her old age? Well, it, it's, it's not my affair, of course, O'Flaherty. Uh, hadn't you to talk to Father Quinlan about it? Talk to Father Quinlan, is it? <laughs> Do you know what Father Quinlan says to me this very morning? Oh, well, you've seen him already, have you? What did he say? <laughs> he says... Now you know, don't you, he says, that it's your duty as a Christian and a good son of the Holy Church to love your enemies, he says. I know it's my duty as a soldier to kill them, I says. That's right, Dinny, he says. Quite right. But, 
says he. You can kill them and do them a good turn afterwards to show your love for them, he says. And it's your duty to have a mass said for the souls of the hundreds of Germans you say you killed, he says. For the many and many of them were Bavarians and good Catholics, says he. Is it me that must pay for masses for the souls of the Boches? I says. Let the King of England pay for them, I says. Was his quarrel and not mine. It, it is the quarrel of every honest man and true patriot, O Flaherty. Your, your mother must see that as clearly as I do. After all, I mean, she's a, a reasonable, well-disposed woman, quite capable of understanding the right and wrong of the war. Why can't you explain to her what the war is about? Aris, sir, how do I know what the war is about? What? Oh, Flaherty, do you know what you're saying? You sit there wearing the Victoria Cross for having killed God knows how many Germans. And you tell me you don't know why you did it? Are you asking your pardon, Sir Pierce? I tell you no such thing. I know quite well why I killed them. Because I was afraid that if I didn't, they'd kill me. Uh, yes, 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 of course, but... Have you no knowledge of the causes of the war, of the interests at stake, of the importance? I may almost say, in fact, I will say, sacred right which we are fighting. Uh, do you read the papers? <laughs> I do when I can get them. There's not many newspaper boys crying the evening paper in the trenches, sir. They do say, Sir Pierce. We shall never beat the Boches until we make Horatio Bottomley Lord Lieutenant of England. Do you think that's true, sir? <laughs> Rubbish, man. There's no Lieutenant in England. King is Lord Lieutenant. It's a simple question of patriotism. Does patriotism mean nothing to you? It means different to me than it would to you, sir. It means England and England's king to you. To me and the like of me, it means talking about the English just the way the English papers talk about the Boches. And what good has it ever done here in Ireland? Hmm? It's kept me ignorant because it filled up my mother's mind and she thought it ought to fill up mine too. It's kept Ireland poor because instead of trying to better ourselves, we thought we was fine fellows of patriots when we were speaking evil of Englishmen. That was as poor as ourselves and maybe as good as ourselves. The Boches I kilt was more knowledgeable men than me and what better am I now than keeping? What better oh, is anybody? Well, I, I, I am sorry. The terrible experience of this war, the greatest war ever fought, has taught you no better, O'Flaherty. I don't know about its being a great war, so It's a big war, but that's not the same thing. Father Quinlan's new church is a big church. You might take the little old chapel out of the middle of it and not miss it. But my mother, she says there's more true religion in that old chapel. And the war has taught me that maybe she was right. Uh, well. And there's another thing it's taught me too, sir, that concerns you and me, if I may make so bold as to tell it to you. I hope it's nothing you ought to say to me, O'Flaherty. Eh? <laughs> well, it's this, sir, that I'm able to sit here now and talk to you without humbugging you. And that's not what one of your tenants or your tenants' children ever did to you before in all your long life. Tis a true respect I'm showing to you at last, sir. Maybe you'd rather have me humbug you and tell you lies as I used, just as the boys here, God help them, would rather have me tell them how I fought the Kaiser that all the world knows I never saw in my life than tell them the truth. But I can't take advantage of you the way I used to. Not even if I seem wanting in respect for you and cocked up by winning the cross. Oh, well, not, not at all, I flirt here. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, sure, what's the cross to me, barring the little pension it carries? Do you think I don't know that there's hundreds of men as brave as me that never got at anything? Never had any luck for anything but bravery, but a curse from the sergeant and the blame for the faults of them that ought to have been their betters? I've learned more than you think so. For how would a gentleman like you know what a poor, conceited, ignorant creature I was when I went from here into the wide world as a soldier? What use is all the lying and pretending and humbugging and letting on? 
when the day comes to you that your comrade is killed in the trench beside you. And you don't so much as look round at him until you trip over his poor body. And then all you say is to ask why the hell the stretcher bearers don't take it out of the way. Why should I read the papers and be humbugged and lied to by them that have the cunning to stay at home and send me to fight for them? Don't talk to me or any soldier about war being right. No war is right. And all the holy water that Father Quinlan ever blessed couldn't make one right. <laughs> there, sir. Now you know what O'Flaherty VC thinks. And you're wiser so than the others who only know what he done. Well, what you did was brave and manly anyhow. Now, God knows whether it was or not better than you nor me, General. I hope he won't be too hard on me for it anyhow. Oh, well, then, yes, yes, we all have to think seriously sometimes, uh, especially when we're a little run down. I'm afraid we've been overworking you a bit over these recruiting meetings. Uh, however, we can knock off for the rest of the day and borrow Sunday. I've had about as much as I can stand myself. Oh, well, it, it's, it's, it's tea time. I wonder what's keeping your mother. <laughs> it's nicely cocked up the old woman will be, having tea at the same table as you, sir, instead of in the kitchen. She'll be after dressing in the height of grandeur, and stop she will at every house on the way to show herself off and tell them where she's going and fill the whole parish up with spite and envy. But sure, she should not be keeping you waiting. Oh, well, that's all right. She must be indulged on an occasion like this. <laughs> I'm sorry my wife is in London. She should be glad to welcome your mother. Sure I know she would, sir. She was always a kind friend to the poor. <laughs> Little her ladyship knew, God help her, the depth of devilment that was in us. We were like a play to her. You see, she was English, sir, and that was how it was. We was to her what the Patterns and Senegalese was to me when I first seen them. I couldn't think somehow that they were liars and thieves and backbiters and drunkards, just like ourselves or any other Christians. Oh, her ladyship never knew all that was going on behind her back. How would she? When I was a wishy child, she gave me the first penny I ever had in my hand. And I wanted to pray for her conversion that night, the same as my mother used to make me pray for yours. And <laughs> do you mean to say that your mother made you pray for my conversion? Sure. And she wouldn't want to see a gentleman like you going to hell after she nursing your own son and bringing up my sister Annie on the bottle. That was how it was, sir. She'd rob you and she'd lie to you and she'd call down all the blessings of God on your head when she wasn't selling you your own three geese that you had thought had been ate by the fox the day after you finished fattening them up. <laughs> and all the time you were like a bit of her own flesh and blood. Often she has said to me she'd like to see, she'd like to live to see you a good Catholic yet, leading victorious armies against the English and wearing the collar of gold that Malachi won on the proud invader. Oh, she's the romantic woman is my mother and no mistake. <coughs> I, I really can't believe this, old Flaherty. I, I could have sworn your mother was as honest as a woman ever breathed. Ah, so she is, sir. She's as honest as the day. Uh, call, it, call it honest. Steal my geese? Ah, she didn't steal them, sir. It was me that stole them. Oh? And why the devil did you steal them? Sure we needed them, sir. Often and often we had to sell our own geese to pay you the rent to satisfy your needs. And why shouldn't we sell your geese to satisfy ours? Oh. <laughs> and me. I... Ah, sure. You had to get what you could out of us. And we had to get what we could out of you. God forgive us both. Really, oh, Flaherty, the war seems to have upset you a little. <laughs> it set me thinking, sir. And I'm not used to it. It's like the patriotism of the English. They never thought of being patriotic until the war broke out. And now the patriotism has took them so sudden and come so strange to them that they run around like frightened chickens, uttering all manner of nonsense. But please God, they'll forget all about it when the war's over. You're getting tired of it already? No, 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 no. It has uplifted us all in a wonderful way. 
world will never be the same again, O'Flaherty. Not after a war like this. Mm. So they all say, sir. I see no great difference myself. It's all the fright and excitement, and when that quiets down, they'll go back to their natural devilment and be the same as ever. It's like the vermin. It'll wash off after a while. Well, the, the long and the short of it is, O'Flaherty, I must decline to be a party to any attempt to deceive your mother. I, I thoroughly disapprove of this feeling against the English, especially at a moment like the present. Even if your mother's political sympathies are really what you represent them to be, I should think her attitude to Gladstone would cure her of such loyal prejudices. She says that Gladstone was an Irishman. So she says, what call would he have to meddle with Ireland, as he did, if he wasn't? What, what nonsense. She suppose Mr. Asquith is an Irishman? Ah, she won't give him any credit for home rule, sir. She says Redmond made him do it. She says you told her so. Well, I, 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 I never meant her to take it up in that ridiculous way. I, I mean, um, I'll give her a good talking to when she comes. I'm not going to stand any of her nonsense. <laughs> it's not a bit of use, sir. She says all the English generals is Irish. She says all the English poets and great men was Irish. She says the English never knew how to read their own books until we taught them. She says we are the lost tribes of the house of Israel and the chosen people of God. She says that the goddess Venus that was born out of the foam at sea came up out of the water in Killany Bay after a head. She says that Moses built the seven churches and that Lazarus is buried in Glasnevin. Oh, how did she know he was? Did you ever ask her? I did, sir, often. And uh, what did she say? Uh, she asked me how did I know he wasn't and fetched me a clout on the side of my head. Have you never mentioned any famous Englishman to her and asked her what she had to say about him? Ah, uh, the only one I could think of was Shakespeare, sir. And she says he was born in Cork. Oh, well, well, I, I give it up. Woman is, oh, well, no matter. <laughs> yes, sir, she's pig-headed and obstinate. There's no doubt about it. She's like the English. They think there's no one like themselves. It is the same with the Germans, though they're educated and not no better. You'll never have a quiet world till you knock the patriotism out of the human race. Still, we, we yeah, must... Wished, it, uh... sir, wished, sir, for God's sake, here she is. The general jumps up. Mrs. O'Flaherty arrives and comes between the two men. She is very clean and carefully dressed in the old-fashioned peasant costume, black silk sunbonnet with a tiara of trimmings and black cloak. Good evening, mother. You hold your wish and learn behaviour while I pay any duty to his honour. And how is your honour's good self? And how is her ladyship and all the young ladies? Oh, it's right glad we are to see your honour back again and look at a picture of health. Well, thank you, Mrs. O'Flaherty. <laughs> uh, well, you see, we, we brought back your son safe and sound. <laughs> I hope you're proud of him. Oh, and indeed, and I am, your honour. Tis the brave boy he is. And who wouldn't he be? Right, oh, boy, your honour's is dead, and with you before his eyes for a pattern of the finest soldier in Ireland. Come and kiss your poor old mother, did he, darling? Oh, that's my own darling boy. Oh, and look at your fine new uniform, stained already with the eggs you've been eating and a party you've been drinking. She takes out her handkerchief, spits on it, and scrubs his lapel with it. Oh, it's the untidy, slovenly one you always wear. There, it won't be seen on the khaki. It's not like the old red coat that will show up everything that dribbled down on it. And they tell me down at the lodge that her ladyship is staying in London and that Miss Agnes is to be married to a fine young nobleman. Oh, it's your honour that is the lucky and happy father. It will be bad news for many of the young gentlemen, the quality right here, sir. His last thought she was going to marry young Master Lawless. 
Ah, God bless you, I'm finding the right word. Indeed, he is a bastoon. Ah, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Ah, oh, and to think at the times of the times I've said that Miss Agnes would be my my lady as her mother was before her, didn't I, Denise? Uh, uh, Well, and uh, now, Mrs. O'Flaherty, I I dare say you have a great deal to say to Dennis. Doesn't concern me. I'll just go in and order tea. Oh, and why would your honour trouble himself? Sure, I can take the boy into the yard. Oh, no, 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 not at all. (laughs) It won't stop in the the least and he's too big a boy to be taken into the yard now when he's made a front seat for himself eh <laughs> sure he has that your honor god bless your honor the general being now out of hearing she turns threateningly to her son with one of those sudden irish changes of manner which amaze and scandalize less flexible nations and exclaims and what do you mean you you lying you scand by telling me you were going to fight again the English. Did you take me for a fool that couldn't find out? And the papers are funny as shaking hands with the English king at Buckingham Palace. I didn't shake hands with him, he shook hands with me. Could I turn on the man in his own house before his own wife with his money in my pocket and in yours and throw his civility back in his face? You take the hand of a tyrant. Red with the blood of Ireland. Nara, hold your nonsense, mother. He's not half the tyrant you are, God help him. His hands were cleaner than mine, that had the blood of his own relations on it, maybe. Is that a way to speak to your mother, you falpine? Oh, it is so, if you won't talk sense to me. It's a nice thing for a poor boy to come <coughs> to be made much of by kings and queens and shook hands with by the height of his country's nobility in the capital cities of the world, then to come home and be scalded and insulted by his own mother. I'll fight for who I like, and I'll shake hands with what kings I like. And if your own son is not good enough for you, you can go and find another. Do you mind me now? Who oh, and was it? The Belgians learned just such breeze and impudence. The Belgians is good men. And the French ought to be more civil to them, let alone they're being half murdered by the Boches. Good men, is it? Good men? To come over here when they were wounded because it was a Catholic country, and then to go to the Protestant church because it didn't cast them anything, and some of them never go near a church at all. And that's what you call good men. Oh, you're the mighty fine politician, aren't you? What you know about Belgians or foreign parts of the world you're living in, God help you. And why wouldn't I know better than you? I'm enjoy your mother. And if you are itself, how can you know what you've never seen as well as me that was dug into the continent of Europe for six months and was buried in the earth a bit three times with the shells bursting on top of me? I tell you, I know what I'm about. I have my own reasons for taking part in this great conflict. I, I'd be ashamed to stay at home and not fight when everyone else is fighting. If you wanted to fight... Why couldn't you fight in the German army? Because they only get a penny a day. Well, and if they do it, sell. Isn't that a French army? And they only get a halfpenny a day. Oh, Lord. It must be a mean lot, Dinny. Maybe you'd have me in the Turkish army and worship the heathen Mohammed that put a corn in his ear and pretended it was a message from the heavens when the pigeon came to pick it out and eat it. I went where I could get the biggest allowance for you. Little thanks I get for it. Allowance, is it? Do you know what the TV blackguards did on me? They came to me and they says, Was your son a big eater? They says, Oh, he was that, says I. Ten shillings a week wouldn't keep him. Sure, I thought the more I said, the more they'd give me. Then, says they, That's ten shillings a week of your allowance, they says. Because you saved up by the king feeding him. Indeed, says I. I suppose if I'd six sons, you'd stop three pounds a week from me and make out that I ought to pay you money instead of you paying me. There's a fallacy in your argument, they says. A what? A fallacy. That's the word he said. I says to him, it's a Pharisee. I'm thinking you mean sober. 
but you can keep your dirty money that your king grudges a poor old widow. And please, God, the English will be got yet for the deadly sin of oppressing the poor. And with that, I shut the door in his face. Do you mean to tell me they knocked ten shillings off you for my keep? No, darling. They only knocked off half a crown. I put up with it because I've got the old age pension. And they know very well I'm only 62. So I'm the better of my half a crown a week anyway. Tis a queer way of doing business. If they tell you straight out what they was going to give you, you wouldn't mind. But if there are 20 ways of telling the truth and only one way of telling a lie, the government would find it out. Tis in the nature of government to tell lies. Teresa Driscoll, a parlour maid, comes from the house. You're to come up to the drawing room to have your tea, Mrs O'Flaherty. Mind you, have a sup of good black tea for me in the kitchen afterwards, Bushman. That mashy drawing room tea will give me the wind if I leave it on my stomach. Is that yourself, Tessie? And how are you? Nicely, thank you. And how's yourself? Yes. Finally, thank God. Look what I brought you, Tessie. Sure, I don't like to touch it, Denny. Did you take it off a dead man? No, I took it off a live one. And thankful he was to be alive and kept a prisoner in ease and comfort. And me left fighting in peril of my life. Do you think it's real gold, Denny? It's real German gold, anyhow. But German silver isn't real, Denny. Well, it's the best the Bosch could do for me, anyhow. Do you think I might take it to the jeweller next market day and ask him? You may take it to the devil if you like. You needn't lose your temper about it. I only thought you'd like to know the nice fool I'd look if I went about showing off a chain that only turned out to be brass. I think you might say thank you. Do you? Well, I think that you might have said something more to me than, is that yourself? You couldn't say less to the postman. Oh, 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 oh. is that what's the matter? Here, come and take the taste of their brass out of my mouth. He seizes her and kisses her. Teresa, without losing her Irish dignity, takes the kiss as appreciatively as a connoisseur might take a glass of wine and sits down with him on the garden seat. Thank God the priest can't see us here. <laughs> Tis little they care for priests in France, Alana. And what had the Queen on her, Denny, when she spoke to you at the palace? Oh, she had a bonnet on without any strings to it. And she had a plaquine of embroidery down her bosom. And she had a waist where it used to be and not where the other ladies had it. And she had little brooches in her ears. Uh, though half, uh, she hadn't half the jewellery Mrs. O'Sullivan had to keep the pot shop down in Trumbog. She dresses her hair over her head in a fringe like, and she had an Irish look about her eyebrows. And she didn't know what to say to me, poor woman, and I didn't know what to say to her. God help me. You'll have a pension now with the cross, won't you, Danny? Sixpence, three farthings a day. That isn't much. I'll take the rest out in glory. And if you're wounded, you'll have a wound pension, won't you? I will, please God. You're going out again, aren't you, Denny? I can't help myself. I'd be shocked for deserted if I didn't go, and maybe I'll be shocked by the boshes if I do go. So between the two of them, I'm nicely fixed up. Tessie! Tessie, darling! I'm wanted for the tea table. You'll have your pension anyhow, Denny, won't you? Whether you're wounded or not. Come, child, come. Oh, sure, I'm coming. And if I do get a pension itself, the devil of a penny of it you'll ever have spent now. It's a shame for you to keep the girl from her duties, Denny. You might get her into trouble. Much I care whether she gets into trouble or not. I pity the man that gets her, her into trouble. He'll get himself into worse. What's that you tell me? Have you been falling out with her? And she a girl with a fortune of ten pounds? Let her keep her fortune. I wouldn't touch her with the tongs if she had thousands and millions. Oh, foy for shame, Diddy. Why would you say the like of that of a decent, honest girl and one of the Driscolls too? Why wouldn't I say it? She's thinking of nothing but getting me out there again to be wounded, that she can spend my pension. Bad scram to her. Why, what's come over you, child, at all, at all? Knowledge and wisdom has come over me, with pain and fear and trouble. I've been made a fool of and imposed upon all my life. I thought that covetous thrill in there was a walking angel. And now, if I ever marry at all, 
I'll marry a French woman. You're not so. And don't you dare repeat such a thing to me. Won't I, Faye? <laughs> I've been as good as married to a couple of them already. Lord be praised. What wickedness have you been up to, you, you, you young blackguard? Now, one of them French women would cook you a meal twice in the day and all days and every day that Sir Pierce himself who might go begging through all of Ireland for and never see the like of. I'll have a French wife, I tell you. And when I settle down to be a farmer, I'll have a French farm with a field as big as the continent of Europe that to ten of your dirty little fields here wouldn't so much as fill the ditch off. Then it's a French mother you may go look for, for I'm done with you. And it's no great loss it'd be if you wasn't. It's only for my natural feelings for you that I care. For it's only an ignorant, silly old country woman you are with your fine talk about Ireland. You, that never stepped beyond the few acres of it you were born on. Penny, darling, why are you like this to me? What's happened to you? What's happened to everybody? That's what I want to know. What's happened to you that I thought all the world of one was afraid of? And what's happened to Sir Pierce that I thought was a great general? And now I see to be no more fit to command an army than an old hen. What's happened to Tessie? But I was mad to marry a year ago, and I wouldn't take now with all of Ireland for her fortune. I tell you, the world's creation is crumbling in ruins about me. And then you come and ask, what's happened to me? Oh, horn. Oh, horn. My son's turned again me. Oh, what'll I do a jolly, jolly, jolly? Oh, 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 no, oh, oh, oh. What's all this infernal noise? What on earth is the matter? Let her hold your wish, but don't you see his honour? Oh, sir, I'm ruined and destroyed. Oh, won't you speak to Dinny, sir? I'm hard scalded with him. He wants to marry a French woman on me and go away and be a foreigner and desert his mother and betray his country. It's mad he is with the roaring of the cannons and he killing the Germans and the Germans killing him. And says to them, my boy is taken from me and turned again me and who is to take care of me in the old age after all I've done for him a horn a horn now hold your noise I tell you who's going to leave you I'm going to take you with me there now does that satisfy you you should take me into a strange land among heathens and pagans and savages and me not knowing a word of their language, not them of mine. Uh, good job they don't. Maybe they think you're talking sense. Ask me to die out of Ireland, is it? And the angels not to find me when they come for me. And would you ask me to live in Ireland where I've been posed on and kept in ignorance? and to die where the devil himself wouldn't take me as a gift, let alone the blessed angels. You can come or stay. You can take your old way, or you can take my young way. But stick in this place, I will not, among a lot of good-for-nothing devils that don't do a hand's turn but watch the grass growing and build up the stone wall where the cow walked through it. And Sir Horace Plunkett, breaking his heart all the time, telling them how they might put the land into decent tillage like the French and the Belgians. Yes, yes, yes. He's quite right, you know, Mrs. O'Flaherty. Well, right sir, there. please, God, the war will last a long time yet. And maybe I'll die before it's over and the separation alone stops. That's all you care about. Tis nothing but milch cows we men are for the women with their separation allowances ever since the war began. Bad luck to them that made it. Manor sent me out for it to tell you, sir, that the tea will be black and the cake not fit to eat with the cold if you don't all come at once. Oh, Tessie, darling, what have you been saying to Ginny at all and all? Oh, oh. You, you, you can't discuss that here. We should have Tessie beginning now. Yeah, that's right, sir. Drive them in. I haven't said a word to him. He... Hold your tongue and go in and attend to your business at the tea table. But I'm not telling your honour that I never said a word to him. He gave me a beautiful gold chain. Here it is to show your honour that it's no lie I'm telling you. Uh, what? 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 What's this, O'Flaherty? You've been looting some unfortunate officer. Uh, no, sir. I stole it from him of his own accord. Oh, 
wouldn't try and tell him that his mother has the first call on it. And what would a slip the girl like that be doing with a gold chain around her neck? Anyhow, I have a neck to put it round and not a hank of wrinkles. You impudent you heifer. How dare you say such a thing to me? Is it me? Offer such a name to you. Oh, oh, silence, Tessie. Did you hear me? Order it. Come down to the house. I can speak to you. Easy, I tell you. Oh, do you wish, brother, will you? You'll be sorry for that. Don't you be one. Get the way to a decent young brother's team. And the Lord says, shut up, will you? Don't have your no respect for yourselves or for your better self. What are you going to do when I open your eyes in the box? You're building the whole crowd here. This is a house you give. Tell me what you have to do. Tell me what you have to do. Two men seized the two women and pushed them, still violently abusing one another, into the house. Sir Peer slams the door upon them savagely. Immediately, a heavenly silence falls on the summer afternoon. The two sit down out of breath, and for a long time nothing is said. Sir Peer sits on an iron chair. A flaherty sits on the garden seat. The thrush begins to sing melodiously. O'Flaherty cocks his ears and looks up at it. A smile spreads over his troubled features. Sir Pierce, with a long sigh, takes out his pipe and begins to fill it. What a discontented sort of animal a man is, sir. Only a month ago, I was in the quiet of the country out at the front, with not a sound except the birds and the bellow of a cow in the distance, as it might be, and the shrapnel making little clouds in the heavens and the shells whistling, and maybe a yell or two when one of us was hit. And would you believe it, sir? I complained of the noise and wanted to have a peaceful hour at home. Well, them two has taught me a lesson. This morning, sir, when I was telling the boys here how I was longing to be back, taking my part for king and country with the others, I was lying, as well you know, sir. Now I can go back and say it with a clear conscience. Some likes war's alarms, and some likes home life. I've tried both, sir, and I'm for war's alarms now. <laughs> I was always a quiet lad by natural disposition. Well, strictly between ourselves, O Flaherty, and as one soldier to another, <laughs> do you think we should have got an army without conscription if domestic life had been as happy as people say it is? Oh, well, sir. Between you, me, and the war, Sir Pierce, I think the less we say about that until the war's over, the better. He winks at the general. The general strikes a match. The thrush sings. The jail laughs. The conversation drops. 